Welcome back to Zero Books and Repeater Media. This is Craig, the host of the Acid Horizon podcast, on a solo mission to rescue from the underworld one Andy Sharp, who is a writer and multimedia artist whom repeater readers will know from his book on repeater entitled The English Heretic. Andy has a new book out on Watkins called The Astral Geographic, The Watkins Guide to the Occult World. It's a magical itinerary which takes you deep into the realms of alchemy, necromancy, psychogeography, and much more. And we definitely want to touch on the themes in that book at some point in our discussion today, but there is another pressing matter in focus today, one which Andy and I take very seriously. And maybe it's best to highlight a question which we will probably tackle at the apex of this discussion, which is, are dreams anti-capitalist? Or maybe the better question is whether there's a real importance to our imagination, which is embodied in dreams, which can help us address uh, the character of our collective fantasies and a world which, or an, an idea or a dream which ultimately refuses continued oppression under existing forms of domination. But there's a lot of presuppositions lurking around this question, namely whether dreams are connected to the political world at all. Fortunately, Andy and I share an interest in a figure who's had much to say on this topic, and that is archetypal psychologist James Hillman. So Andy and I are going to talk about the work and legacy of Hillman and its implications for various aspects uh, of the way we live our lives. And Andy, I just wanted to say thank you for your kind interactions via email and agreeing to sit down with me today. Oh, no, it's a real pleasure. Um, it's great. I think it's really good, as I said to you, that uh, to see um, James Hillman being uh, using philosophical um, writing as well as uh, psychology. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I encountered Hillman a long time ago. In fact, before many of the philosophical figures that are probably most interesting or I'm most involved with today. But I would say kind of at this stage of my life, Hillman's made a sort of resurgence. And he has, a, he has connections to a lot of figures in philosophy, like Gilles Deleuze, for example. I, I think there's a lot of strong overlap between his ideas. But I, I'm curious, how, how did you get into James Hillman? He, he's an American. You're living in the UK. How did he make his way over to the British Isles? Yeah, so I first read about him um, many years ago in a in a countercultural magazine called Rapid Eye, which was all part of the kind of industrial subculture type thing, and it it, it was kind of like an English version of uh, re research publications. And they had an interview with Derek Jarman, and Derek Jarman, uh, the you know the filmmaker who's associated with uh, Coil and kind of um, Templar Psychic Youth, he he mentioned him, and you know when I was um, as a teenager, you were always using references and, and sort of sort of voraciously feeding off any reference. So I started looking at his stuff probably when I was about 18. But to be honest, um, I, I wasn't sophisticated enough to understand some of the ideas there. So um, uh, and I hadn't read much Jung. So I think I needed to understand other things before I understood Hillman. So I came back to him about uh, 10 years later, and it all made a lot more sense. And it's, I think with Hillman, it's very important to read it at the right time. There's, mm. a, there's a kind of temporal sort of significance to his work because it's so layered and things like that, that different things chime. And it's such a broad, he writes on such a broad manner of topics that something will hit you at a particular time. And I was interested at that time, um, I, I was probably just, sort of starting off English heretic, so it, it provided a kind of backbone for a lot of the English heretic concepts, albeit in a different idiom. Um, so it made a lot of sense because I was actually, you know, looking at uh, Neoplatonic occultism as well in a, in a kind of modern light. And um, he also helped bridge a divide that I'd, I'd sort of made a connection between J.G. Ballard's work and, and, and some sort of kind of post post Crowley and occultism and, and concepts of like Cliff Off and, and sort of deleterious sort of um, aspects of modern modern world like you know atomic uh, disaster and things like that and Hillman really provided a bridge from kind of Freud and Jung which very much is where Ballard stops and into a kind of like an occult reading um, so, and the weird thing is, I've never ever seen 
um, Ballard reference Hillman, but there's so many overlaps in their ideas. That's interesting. So how in your book, The English Heretic, for example, I, I mean, we see plenty of references directly to James Hillman in your new book, but how does Hillman factor into the work that you've done with imaginal documentaries? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, as I said, it was very uh, kind of an idiosyncratic and it was kind of, the way I used it was 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 as a learning exercise, essentially. So I'd be reading um, Hillman and, you know, taking on the ideas of kind of revisioning particularly and seeing through and things like that. But I, I was applying it to a kind of... Um, a cultural lens it was you know english heretic was a lot of black humor really um so these imaginal documentaries as i like to think of them were were a way of kind of creating this these kind of um almost uh, you know uh, you know dali's idea of a paranoid critical theory but applying it to documentary making so you were you were looking at connections but imagistic connections so um you know, a good example was I did this piece called Mondo Paranoia that was um, a kind of subversion of the idea of, I did a lot of it was subversion of the idea of heritage history. So this was a kind of a pastiche of, you know, the Kennedy assassination. And I looked at um, uh, the kind of imagistic similarities or connections between Kennedy's death um, C.S. Lewis's death. C.S. Lewis and um, Aldous Huxley all died on the same day. They all died on twenty second of November. So, um, so there was this this weird connection, and then I kind of used the kind of sort of Hillman esque approach in order to kind of tie these narratives together. So, looking at kind of imagistic correspondences, which is, you know, it's not it's not a, a I, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's a, a factual truth, but there's a, what I was interested in is an imaginal kind of story to be told. And um, so it's very creative and very speculative, and, and it is an imaginative story. But nevertheless, it's kind of taking history and and, uh, and, and pop culture and our culture and putting it through the lens of Hillman's thinking, which is essentially, you know, following the images rather than kind of some, some sort of... Um, uh, reductive analytical approach to to a subject matter. Yeah, let's dive into that a little bit. And I'm going to have to play fast and loose here just to get to the to the heart of our discussion, which is um, Hillman develops his theories out of the the broader theory of analytical psychology of of Carl Jung. And we we could say about Carl Jung, oh, the overlap between Carl Jung and and Hillman is is manifold, but perhaps one of the strongest points of overlap is this concept of an archetype where images in our fantasies, in our daydreams, and in our dreams at night have this archetypal character that bears an imprint of things that we see in ancient myth and folklore. And in analytical psychology, or at least in, in some of the ways that it's been treated, these myths then become a sort of paradigm or a rubric by which we determine the meanings of dreams. And then in a therapeutic context, we take these meanings and try to build up a, a, a broader edifice of meaning for our lives. That, that might be one way to do it. But Hillman is somewhat critical of this maneuver, primarily because, as you pointed out, Andy, there's a kind of reductive maneuver being made whenever we put the kind of stamp or imprint of a particular ar archetypal reading over any dream that we might have. Hillman has this idea of sticking to the image, and this is something that you alluded to, following the images, and also this distinction that you, you also alluded to, which is the distinction between factual reality and a quote-unquote imaginal reality. And so maybe we could unpack those ideas through the work that you've done, particularly, I mean, it really interests me that the idea, for example, that JFK, C.S. Lewis, and Aldous Huxley all died on the same day. What is the imaginal through line there? And, 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 and take me through how you would use Hillman's techniques to, to articulate that relationship. Okay, so, so yeah, I mean, so I look at... Um, this, this is going back a bit, so I'm just trying to remember the, the, the thread I made. So, um, so uh, I do a, a number of comparisons here. So, I um, with with um, 
with the actual deaths, I compare their kind of uh, uh, various kind of images associated with their death because Huxley was given a kind of um, huge dose of LSD as he was passing away, so intravenous injection, and he kind of died blissfully in the arms of his second wife and his first. And his second wife was saying, "You know, I want you to go up, you know, in bliss." Um, to your first wife and then I compare that almost you know imagistically compared the Kennedy death which is a gun to his head which is a violent an utterly violent demise in the in again in his wife's arms and things like that so a look at the the kind of almost the the parallels in the in the process of their dying and things like that so that's one example um but I take it quite you know, it, go, it, it fans out quite a bit. So I look at other other correspondence. So C.S. Lewis's death, um, for instance, um, I take, uh, you know, I look at Aslan, the lion that's um, sacrificed and things like that, and look at kind of this notion of uh, kind of the, the sacrifice of the king and things like that, which is, um, again, like there was a sort of Balladian reading there because in, in, in Ballard's uh, Miracles of Life, he alludes... Kennedy's death, the death of the Corn King, which sort of reinvigorated the world, you know. So, so we kind of he suggested we needed this sacrifice for the sixties. So, um, yeah. So look at sort of various aspects of uh, of um, C.S. Lewis's stories, um, but I, t- I, I I bring in some quite sinister sort of connections here. So, um, so the day after Kennedy's assassination, the Moors murderers in, in England kill their first victim and things like that and there's kind of this psychological thing saying well they were triggered by the Kennedy assassination so I look at various connections between um their their murder and, and this place called Underland uh and it's uh, Underland is in Narnia and things like that and I look at the kind of the way that they visited the moors and buried these children in the moors and and, and relate it to kind of this kind of Underland where the witch lives in in um in in C.S. Lewis's so so it's it, you know it's kind of parodic really but it's you know it, but in a weird way it isn't essentially parodic um, because um, after uh, nine uh, nine eleven a couple of months after nine eleven um, James Hillman gave this speech um, t- uh, in Tel Aviv about a kind of um, archetypal reading of of nine eleven events and it and it's easily as out there as anything I wrote and he looks at kind of um you know the concept of the fall um and and three aspects of the fall uh in in philosophical terms um in terms of like kind of um uh hubris and retribution and things like that and then but then he goes into kind of a wild sort of tangent where he looks at the astrology around the time of 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 9-11 9-11 and says you know the astrologers were concerned because there was this kind of um, meeting between Pluto and Saturn three times in a short short spate over that period and he alludes to various events right that so that's kind of I can't remember whether I read that piece before I did the Mondo Paranoia but there, there's striking similarities in the kind of audacity if you like um, so so that's the kind of approach I did with 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 so it's connection, but it's uh, um, and I'm doing a lot of replacement of images, as I said, replace you know this this image with this image, you know the the syringe with the the gun and things like that. So it's you know it's a surrealistic device essentially, but it's also uh, uh, an imaginal device really. I think that's one of the really grand things that Hillman has bestowed to us uh, in here in the 21st century, maybe as opposed to the 20th century analytical psychologists is the utter modularity of, of the imagination. And, you know, thinking about perhaps, for example, how people, individuals and and societies and cultures with different imaginal constructs can link in and interact with one another and speak a kind of imaginal language. And you talk about James Hillman quite a bit in your new book, The Astral Geographic, uh, which is a book, as we mentioned earlier, it covers alchemy, it covers psychogeography, uh, necromancy, and the idea of active imagination comes up. And you give 
quite a nice explanation of that. And I think that this is one thing I, I believe is essential to understanding Hillman and his method is this use of active imagination. And uh, prior to us pressing record here earlier today, you mentioned that you're a software engineer. I don't know if I can leave that in the recording or not, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but it, it's always curious to me to see someone, for example, who's in a technical trade like you, like what, what sort of value, like, first of all, what is active imagination as you explain it in, in your new book? And do you find any personal or practical value in these methods in your own work? Well, in my day work, no, not, not, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, um, I think we'll come back to this topic later about, because you talk about irrationalism and things like that, and uh, I have a reading on that, which I mentioned briefly in the book. But the active imagination is, um, it's kind of sensate uh, conversation with the, the, uh, the uh, like a waking dream. So um, when I was about 18 or 19, I was interested in, in, in practical magic and also psychology. And um, obviously one of the, the techniques of uh, practical magic is this concept of astral projection, um, where you kind of project out your body and then have a conversation with the, the various spirits or various people who occur, occur in your reality. Um, now, when I when I try to do this in a conscious way, it was it felt very false. But then I uh, started, um, you know, reading uh, Jung's ideas of active imagination, where you 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 know you basically involve yourself in a conversation with with whoever comes to you in your visual sphere when you start meditating or thinking on a, on a particular topic but you treat them as real people you don't treat them as 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 kind of um fictions you know you you, you interact with them as if they're real people and you interact with the landscape as if it's a real landscape and you move through it and things like that so so jung's idea of the active imagination is 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 after a dream um rather than interpret the dream you can use the active imagination to step back into the dream and um, investigate different areas of it and, and, and relationships if it was a living entity. Now, um, I found that invaluable for writing fiction when I was when I was younger. You know, I was, I was you know I'm writing it as a hobby really, um, but I found some a very strange sort of um, sensations happening when I did that. You know, things like. Uh, sort of prickling up the back of the neck, and um, and the visual sphere became very, uh, very vibrant. Um, and then I suddenly realised this is actually very close to the, the, the landscapes that are described in in astral projection. Now, I think they're kind of one and the same thing, really. And I think um, there's different terminology, um, but the, the actual process and the actual um, endeavor is is to is to essentially have a sensate relationship with the with 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 the dream world while you're waking, and so that's what active imagination is. Um, and so Jung gives a bunch of things of, uh, about active ima imagination, but uh, but Hillman takes ma ma active imagination a bit further and says, you know, this is not this is not a process of uh, achieving kind of blissful states. What it is is a never-ending um, Ouroboros of know thyself with uh, with a pandemonium of images as if you were in a theatre. So, so whereas, you know, the idea of kind of meditative practice is shutting down the mind, um, in Hillman, he's, he's actively saying, you know, we need to engage with, with, with kind of the gods through active imagination, but it's, it's a kind of riotous, never ending process, um, which is very close to alchemy in a sense, mm. metic thinking. When I first encountered this material, it was really in the wake of a, an imaginal crisis of sorts. I was living overseas and, and, and people who are listening to this have probably heard this story maybe two or three times on other episodes, but I was living in Japan um, and I was a teacher, which is not an uncommon sort of thing for an expatriate to do. But during that time, and maybe somewhat as a function of the culture shock while living there, I started to experience night terrors. And prior to that, uh, early in my life, maybe around the time I was four to seven years old, I had pretty significant 
episodes of sleep paralysis. And maybe, yeah, and maybe just to connect one thing that you mentioned earlier is that, you know, you talk about the hair standing up on the back of your neck. When, when I think about what life is like and how, how long life can actually be uh, in, a, in a certain way of looking at things, it's very rare, I would say, beyond my teenage years or beyond my youth, to have an experience where I feel just utterly electrified by an image in my mind to the point where you're getting goosebumps or maybe you have some trepidation about going down a, a certain hallway or something where you're absolutely enraptured by the imagination. And it makes me think, you know, what kind of world do we live in where we somehow either you know, we've created a program of extinction for the imagination where these things don't happen and that in order for them to happen, we have to have a very sort of intentional intervention with it. And that makes me curious, you know, at any point in your encounter with this material, did you ever start dreaming or did you find that your own mind was becoming more active? And are there any, any particular dreams that you have that, that, that sort of stand out? Well, there's a few things here to, to, to um to discuss so when i was probably about 21 22 i got very interested in um kind of sort of tantric practice and uh, raising a kundalini um, and i had to stop because i had such dreadful nightmares of electrocution um these these constant um these constant uh night terrors and, and you know where you would have false endings to dreams a bit like kind of a horror film where you come out of it but you're still asleep you know which is kind of indicative of sleep paralysis it, uh, succubal experiences and things like that uh, you know and stuff like that and uh then i realized yeah actually this is this is serious this does work um you probably need a a, a guide if you're going to do this so so yeah i experienced a lot of night terrors when i was when i was exploring occultism um but um it's interesting. One of Hillman, you know, one of Hillman's earliest books called *Pan and the Nightmare*, which is which is exactly about this. So it's a it's, it's a review of a nineteenth century essay, but he, he he touches on it quite a bit. Um, but no, not not so much in 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 adult life uh, engaging with Hillman. But what I did is I did spend a bit of time looking at the kind of exploring kind of the Hillman esque dream paradigm and i found that extremely interesting and extremely um kind of non non-productive in a way because i would explore dreams in in the hill so so if we hillman looks at dreams uh and and says you know we need to stick with the images rather than um uh sort of interpret them so a classic image in a dream would be of a snake or uh that you would through Freudian or or Jungian or even Christian, you would uh, you would um, read as kind of a phallic or a you know like a, a devil or something like that. And Hillman says, no, no, what you need to do is stick with the image. The the, the dream belongs to the day world. Uh, sorry, to the night world. It's not there as a kind of uh, resource for the day world. So what you want to do is stick with that image. Look at the snake. Have a conversation with with the snake, feel what it's like, look at its color, look at its texture, and have a sensate relationship with that that snake itself. Um, so I started exploring that in in dreams, um, in, in and it was quite interesting what, the way the material would change. And I, I briefly mentioned this in the book, where I'm talking about uh, practicing astral travel, uh, uh, active imagination so one of the exercises is to visualize uh, uh, a symbol on a door and, and walk through the door that's so you have all these processes of like sort of entering this this kind of like hypnotic suggestion you know just processes of of entering this world in, in a in a tangible way and i'm saying what ha tends to happen and this is based on active uh, studies of active imagination and, and working with uh Hillman's dream paradigm is that soon after opening that door, you will find a tree, which is the same material as, as the door, and you might find a, a, a seal on that. So, so these things happen in, in a kind of very autonomic way. And I think, I think in your book, I thought it was really interesting about your concept of autocathonic. 
And I think that's a really important concept to 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 actually just trust this auto autochthonic process that happens um, uh, when we engage with active imagination. Yeah, and he's talking about our book Anti Oculus: A Philosophy of Escape, which is out on repeater now, and. For that book, one of my primary contributions was a discussion of the politics of the image. And, and so we're edging up on this question of politics right now. Um, I guess this we should just go right for the gusto here and talk about how, for example, the dream world or the underworld, Hades, as Hillman imagines it, could be a kind of anti-capitalist space. One of, And I did a video on this actually for, for this very channel where... Hillman in Dream in the Underworld, one of his most popular books, talks about the capitalism of the ego, which is, so for example, if you have a dream and then you go to a therapist and you want this dream interpreted, well, you, why do you want it interpreted? Well, you want it interpreted for your general wellness, or maybe you want to find out what's going on so that you can enhance your effectivity or your you know, the, the utilitarian dimension of our life. And Hillman thinks that this is an absolutely flawed way to approach uh, the dream world because images and the, the, the phrase I actually steal from Mark Fisher, and we'll talk about Mark Fisher in a little bit too, but Mark Fisher uses in his uh, dissertation, Flatline Constructs, this concept of entification. And I thought that was such a nice word to map onto the concept of dealing with images in a way as if they were entities, right? Rather than dismissing them as sort of specters of the imagination, just this ephemera that just kind of you know, sublimates off the top of our head on any given day. But what Hillman suggests is we can involute this ego and we can experience the world in a way where it's alive. It's like an entity and these images are like entities. And this has implications for the way we treat things like nature, the environment, cities, cultures, um, our family relationships, our friendships and so forth. And so I was wondering, and we'll just start with you, Andy, like what, what do you think in Hillman's work or just in your own thoughts makes dreaming potentially against capital in some way? Okay. Yeah. So this is, I mean, um, I think I heard about it first on an interview that Hillman was, he was talking more generally about, um, kind of child, child psychology really. And, and the way in America people send their kids to, to a therapist, like they're sending a car to a garage, and they want him back when they're fixed. He's kind of um, so. So his kind of concept is therapy is for life and a therapeutic way of living. Um, and obviously, that follows into or follows from, you know, his book, The Dream in the Underworld. So in the Dream in the Underworld, um, the, the essential it's it's a very strange book because you come to it expecting. To understand the dream from the uh, the day world, but what you end up understanding is kind of the the hermetic nature of the dream and the very mysterious nature of the dream and what it, what it's actually serving. But it certainly isn't serving the day world. So so Hillman gives a, a lot of examples of of how we how we tend to use dream interpretation um, in order to you know you're either looking. You know, or shall I get out of this relationship, or shall I go into that relationship, or you know, or or that you know, I'm, I'm anxious about my job. Should I change my job? So we're we're dream interpretation, your, your family relationships, your parental relationships, all the kind of classic Freudian thing. Um, but but he's saying that you know that's that, as you said as you said that's that's. Essentially, it's it's capitalising on 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 these autochthonic processes that are happening uh, when you're asleep, you know, and it's actually quite deluded to think that what is happening in your brain when you're asleep is somehow related to what you're going to do the next day or or, or, your, or your life path, because these are these are very conscious decisions, and you know the, the, what what actually is a dream you know um we've we've come to this con conception that a dream is is a kind of um it's a kind of neurotic um neurotic uh mirror of 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 what's happening in your life 
and it isn't at all. You know, the dream, he he makes a really fascinating argument, and as he said, he he challenges what he calls the dream ego. So so when we go into dream, uh, we the the dream ego wants to take something from that dream, but he says no, it's the exact opposite. The dream ego needs to go into that dream uh, as if it's you know entering, you know, uh, and and let the dream tell itself really so he he compares he calls it digestion he he says a dream uh a dream is a digestion of the of the day world so all the material that goes in to a dream is is digested to create soul essentially to create a uh, um uh, an essence of of uh, of a of a kind of internal world and he he makes the analogy between uh with the with the egyptians who who'd like put bits of their day world into the into the tombs and stuff like that they weren't there to come back out they were there to travel with with you in in in, in the underworld so there's some very interesting things he does in in dream in the underworld to show classic tropes of dreams and what they what they seem to be what's the another reading it so for instance running late in a dream this common concept of retardation in a dream he 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 says well the dream is actually slowing down and existing outside time. Uh, and, you know, this common sort of thing that we have in dream, we're late for something, we're late for that something. That's that's actually the dream world telling you that it's not in time. It exists outside time, you know. So, this, so th- that, that reading is very hermetic and it's very strange, you know, in terms of it ends up in a, a kind of a very uh, – cryptic world of of um sort of hermetic thinking where it's 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 it can't be resolved it can't be resolved all it can be done is to go deeper into this 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 journey really and we do it every night you know and 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 essentially you know they're they're kind of in a sense the dream uh, when we're asleep we're the closest to death so they're probably more associated with preparing for death than they are for life Mm, yeah. I think potentially one of the upshots for the day world, which I mean, in the end, I think Hillman is suggesting that our encounter with the night world and a certain comportment towards it can have day world impacts, but not if our approach to it has a day world um, mindset as, as as we approach it or, or try to grasp the uh, these images. but. Um, the, the one sort of overlap, I think, between dream work, at, the, at least the way that Hillman envisions it, and um, maybe what we would call political or historical consciousness, class consciousness, is an attunement to, and, and Hillman uses this phrase quite a bit from W.H. Uh, Auden, um, you know, we are lived by forces that we pretend to understand. And I think when it comes to understanding, for example, the way that capital works or the way that the ways that we are subjectivated by the institutions of our world, sometimes it's hard to get our finger on the pulse of those things without really taking a step back. I mean, we have tools, we have philosophy, sociology and psychology and so forth. But I think what what Hillman is doing is he's going right to the base layer and saying that what underlies even our heuristics and our disciplines is the image itself. And so if we begin to treat these images as entities in a certain way, there's a kind of yielding that I think we get rewarded with uh, an opening of a kind of consciousness. I I, I don't know. What what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, and this ties in with the anti-capitalism. So, you know, uh, you know, where, where, um, you know, where Hillman breaks with, with, Jung and what what really beefed him about Jung was this concept of spiritual inflation. So he was concerned that this the process of individuation was leading to kind of like a messianic thing where the the the, the spirit is inflated. Now, air inflation, you know, they've all that's that's all got kind of like capitalistic term ter, you know terminology. Where Hillman. Uh, brings in the concept of the soul is really interesting because the soul doesn't seem to have any it doesn't offer any material gain it doesn't it you know there's no there's you you make soul but you don't you don't 
you don't get anything back from it you don't get any material gain from it so in that sense it's a very um anti-capitalist sort of strategy that that, that what you're going to do and how you're going to live your life in an insold world isn't necessarily going to be harmonious with uh the day world as we know it and uh being being successful you know you, you know ultimately you know all these even magic in, in a lot of degrees is this concept of being successful in life um you know and having some sort of material gain um but the way the the, the approach of the soul is is almost the exact opposite it's, it's this it's this kind of work that you do and and the work is to transform yourself inside and then the outside you become a reflection or the, the outside becomes a reflection of the inside and the inside becomes a reflection of the out which is again um essentially alchemical sort of transmutation but it's an internal process you know and 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 you're not it's not the the strange thing about hillman is he, he's not going to make you more successful in your career or anything like that you know and this is where it's quite paradoxical because and this is where he gets a lot of criticism because it, it, they, they, uh, people say well you know you're not not really helping people are you in, in this sense but you, you you're absolutely right what he's what he, his concern is bigger here it's about insulting the world you know we can insult the world then we wouldn't have to worry about you know um you know we wouldn't blame ourselves for everything you know and in in city in the soul it's a good example of the way he looks at the way that you know oh rather than internalize our depressions and things like that we can see them symptoms of the a world that isn't in soul um there's one thing i want to say about kind of this kind of whole idea of acid consciousness because i was thinking about i mean you were acid horizon mark had acid communism and i i, I actually spoke to mark about a year before he died and uh uh i was chatting to him over his place and i said oh of course acid communism it's a take on acid fascism isn't it you know those books there were, there's a book called mind fuckers isn't it that came out in the in the, in the 70s it's a called classic of acid fascism mark and he said no no it was nothing to do with that um so i started thinking about the idea of the relationship between acid and soul and it, it, it's quite it's it's, it's quite obvious because acid is associated with the psychedelic experience and psychedelia means bit, uh revealing the soul so in actual fact you know the, the, the this is this is interesting that there's, there's this new this is concept that mark was developing and that you're that you're uh, taking on uh you know applying the word acid but you could e equally say that's to do with the soul as well well it you know i and, and forgive me if I've confused things a bit here. I've been having a conversation with both you and Federico Campagna via email, and both of you knew Mark Fisher, and we've both been talking about acid communism. And I think both of you mentioned either introducing Hillman to, or um, yeah, introducing Hillman's work to Mark. Uh, was it you, I, and forgive me if, if I've forgotten, was it you or Federico who did that? Did you have a conversation with Mark about James Hillman at some point? Yeah, I gave him my copy of The Dream in the Underworld. Um, oh, and did he? Was... Took it with him. So, uh, <laughs> oh, really? And you didn't have a follow up conversation on that? I, he had it for years, you know. Um, oh, he did. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, <laughs> it sort of tipped him over the edge, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, so I don't, you know, but. Uh, and there, but it was based on a conversation with Mark because uh, mm -hmm. Mark, it's, I, I've been talking about Hillman, and, and he goes, "Oh, Federico's really interested in Hillman." So I said, oh, mm. "I'll read of this." So it was. Uh, I'm not sure whether they, how much he dug into it because he's obviously so busy on various things. But um, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think he would have uh, he would have connected with it. Well, I think it's there's a resonance and you, you pointed it out before I did. Um, I'm actually writing something right now that that's bringing together the work of Hillman and, and Mark Fisher, because when I read the fragment or the, the incomplete essay on acid communism, I couldn't help but think of Hillman's work, especially where he notes, uh, for example, theorist, um, Ellen Willis's claim that in order for anything like a revolution to take place, there needs to be a massive, shift at the psychic level that, um, you know, if we proceed with the kind of politics that 
that we envision through, for example, the Marxist paradigm um, or you know any number of like anarchist paradigms or whatever, we are bound to repeat some of the same mistakes that we see under nationalist forms of capitalism and and and, and so forth. And uh, one of the things, one, one of the places of overlap between both James Hillman and Mark Fisher is, and we see this particularly in Hillman's work, is the idea that this Promethean mode of expression um, that we find in the 19th and 20th century imagination has brought about the very horrors that we're trying to combat politically on the left today. And so what Hillman asks us to do is, is to engender this attitude that undercuts that tendency. And I think we see a bit of that in acid communism too, when we're asked to kind of take a trip, you know, to float upstream as, as Mark talks about. But the, the obvious criticism coming from another portion of the left is that the work of James Hillman, especially having its provenance in something like alchemy or, or Carl Jung, has, you know, this inherent irrationalism built into it. And, 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 you know, this is a kind of criticism that we see in the work of Gregory Lukash, for example, and, you know, his attack on Carl Karenyi, who was, uh, you know, an affiliate of, of, of Jung. And, you know, eventually, you know, Lukash had Karenyi m removed from his position, really for what chalked up to be no good reason other than that he thought his, his theories and ideas were irrational. Um, I'm curious what you think, because there's a part of me that is hugely sympathetic towards Hillman's idea that if we end up somehow displacing this part of our imagination that, that is deemed irrational or is deemed out of the realm of the control of the ego, it's going to appear in other places in our world. You know, whether that's, you know, in a sort of like shadow aspect in, in, the, in the Jungian accent or, um, you know, it's going to crop up, you know, in other places and it, it's going to demand that we integrate it somehow. So I'm, I'm curious what your take on that is. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, irrationality is an interesting topic of like kind of, um, so it seems entirely irrational that Trump and Biden are running for for presidency you know that's that's that is that isn't doesn't feel rational to me you know so so uh irrationality uh seems to be quite um prevalent in reality so i'd argue that and 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 this is this is a you know dadaism came out of the irrationality of the, the first world war so the you know it's kind of like almost fighting irrationality with irrationality um but yeah, so I do touch on this a bit in in the Astral Geographic um, because I was, I was, you know, I was thinking about my career and my life. So uh, I'm I, I, a very rational, a uh, logical, uh, logical job, um, and um, my uh, my qualifications are in, in in medical science. So my MSc is in neuroscience. So, um, I mean, neuroscience is 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 essentially reductive science, you know, in terms of kind of um, these days, you know, looking at everything boiling down to sort of molecular biology and genetics, really. But um, there's a guy called Patrick McNamara who came up with this idea of decentering, um, and he he um, he sees the ego as a as a process rather than a thing, and it's it's kind of a tight loop in the in it, it, handled by various areas of the the frontal cortex, and they keep this system under control. Um, and the process of decentering, either through you know kind of meditation or ecstatic dance or, or drugs. Um, uh, results in this this kind of central control mechanism being loosened and people being able to decenter. So there's two modes of thinking. There's associative thinking, which is associated with kind of magical, irrational thinking. I don't think it's entirely irrational. What I would say is it's 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 a mode of thinking uh, formed of association. So you're thinking associatively rather than log, you know, kind of binary logic or or reductive logic. Um, so, so this process of decentering it, it gets you, uh, allows you to um, escape the kind of world of reductive thinking and inhabit a world of associative thinking. So, rather than irrationality, I would say magic and um, 
imaginal psychology uh, and things like that are are an adoption of associative thinking, which again, like it's there's another concept in in kind of anthropology of magical thinking. So you know the traditional idea is that um, primitive societies. Uh, you know, they have customs that are based on magical thinking. But in actual fact, Susan Greenwood in this in this book says, well, when when they interviewed, you know, people in tribes, they said, we know perfectly well how to 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 employ reductive thinking. We just don't choose to. So 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 what I would say is that we can have a choice and we can do it um maybe once a week on a Thursday at seven o'clock in order to invoke Jupiter, you know, so I don't think that the associ- uh, living life, I, I don't think associative thinking and reductive thinking are should be the entirety of your life. You should be able to choose, which, you, you know, and, and the ultimate freedom in life is to be able to choose how you think. Um, but I agree, you know, you can't live life entirely irrationally because, you, you know, this would be, you know, you would end up, you know, you'd end up. In a, in, a, in a hospital or dead, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't espouse the idea of of living life completely rational in a completely irrational way or an associative way. If you think, I, I prefer the term associative sort of mindset. But you can do it in a ritual context. So it's a ritual. So ritual is a, a decision to do it, and 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 you know, then you apply different correspondences to give that. It's almost like, as you say, give it that kick, you know, give it that kick so that you, you will form a, uh, you know, planetary magic I actually sort of explore in the book in terms of geography. So you can give it, a, a, you know, you can give give this kind of experience or this place you want to investigate reality in, in, a, in a kind of laboratory conditions. You, you can do it um, through correspondences. So you can do a ritual on a Thursday at 7 o'clock. So, it gives, so even though... You, you know, this associative thinking is associated. It, you know, um, in terms of ritual, you know, it's, there's, there's a there's a system there, you know, for for when you do it to give it heightened significance. Mm. And this brings us to what I think is one of the important structuring metaphors of of Hillman's work is the idea of a laboratory, the idea of alchemy, alchemy not as a rational science but as a practice of the imagination and a, an ongoing work to create a substance beyond the ego. And this is, this is one thing that, that, you know, talking about the politics of the matter, I, I think Hillman had, puts in uh, the politics of the ego in direct contradistinction with the idea of, of alchemical becomings, that there can be this kind of work on the imagination that transcends the boundaries of how we ordinarily understand ourselves. And this is a big part of your book, The Astral Geographic, and this figure of Fulcanelli, who, d- despite all of my alchemical predilections, I'd never looked at, and I had to go watch some videos on YouTube and, of course, read your chapter. But th- this is somebody who, who's quite interesting and maybe adjacent to the Hillman stuff a little bit. Could you talk about that a little bit? Um, what's happening in the Astral Geographic with alchemy? And and should we know about this alchemist, Fulcanelli? Fulcanelli? Yes. Yeah, so so Fulcanelli was, uh, you know, a very interesting character. So, so he's, he's quite possibly a confabulation of, of, of two um, two people, one called Eugene Cancillier and another guy called Julian, John Julian Champagne. Um, and this this master alchemist was supposedly their teacher and he delivered this book called uh, the mystery of cathedrals around about 1926 uh, and then disappeared um and the, the 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 book purports to uh explain the alchemical or, or rather suggests that the uh the, the plaques and engravings around the porch door at Notre Dame Cathedral uh, elucidate the alchemical process and suggests that, that the actual um, ma- masons were, were were alchemists. That's a sort of surface thing, but uh, but underla- underlying it is this is a kind of is a is a magical language called uh, the Langa Verd, the green language, um, that Fulcanelli uh, uses to expound the theories of alchemy. Um, and it's a it's a it's a really interesting language that's full of puns and and also visual doubles. So 
you know, uh, again, imagistic doubling all the time, you know. Um, but what what I discovered, I mean, I read a lot of Falconelli and things like that, and um, there's a, there's a particular um, there's a particular window in a in a church in London that has this um, uh, uh, carving of a of a of a of a uh, sort of barrel with a with a um, arrow through it, and Falconelli looks at this as a as a significant kind of process of like divulging the alchemical language. It's called a rebus, a visual pun. So the, the guy, the, the, the prior of this church, St. Bartholomew, was called Bolton. So this, this, this kind of image is a, is, is, a, is a visual pun of his name. And that's used throughout heraldry and things like that. Um, and and uh, so Falconelli makes all this connection between kind of language of heraldry and, and alchemy and things like that. But what's really interesting is that, is that Freud... Um, Considered the rebus as the the kind of um, as a root sort of process in dreaming. So um, so dreams are kind of pre literate. So if you think about the brain as it's operating in a dream, it's it's not literate. So when you read a book, you can't read a book in a dream. The words move all over the place and things like that. So you, you haven't got the capacity to do kind of intellectual activity. So what the brain is doing is is it, it's making uh, visual associations all the time, uh, as, and, 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 and these are creating like visual puns and give the the internal logic of a dream. Um, so that's I think that's very interesting because uh, in a sense – that's kind of quite similar to Hillman's uh, idea. So, so this this Kabbalah that um, Falconelli develops, he calls it. It's based on homophones rather than kind of numeric Kabbalah in Hebrew. So, words sounding the same. Um, and actually, Hill, I was reading Hillman yesterday, and he was talking exactly about the way that puns can in dream, you know, kind of punning language can actually sort of. Give a kickstart into a different kind of deeper meaning of 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 an image, um, and obviously the sort of classic cases is, is James Joyce's work and and particularly Finnegan's Wake, which is a kind of massive sort of pun about the you know dreaming mind of Finnegan and things like that. So um, it all ties in very neatly with with this kind of idea that there's a there's a there's a kind of language and a a, a kind of almost synesthetic language that's happening when we're dreaming. Um, and I think that's where the Falconelli's real value actually is. Um, and one of the interesting things that I found out about Falconelli is that he claims that the alchemists had the key to nuclear power before the scientists did. Is there anything you can tell us about that? That seemed so strange, especially since at the time that Falconelli was was trending as we might say today we were on the eve of of discovering nuclear power yeah i think it was it was you know if you think about uh theory of relativity we don't actually have to you know we can you know that's theoretical so a lot of the the, the kind of ideas from alchemy were the theoretical, but also the spiritual, and and also the kind of moral consequences of of exploring in a certain way. So, you know, I think my my feeling is that there was some sort of kind of equivalent of like kind of the the, the what Einstein was doing with kind of visualization and visualization, the process of splitting the atom and taking things further, and 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 the, the alchemical process and the dangers of doing that. So I think there's there's that that particular reading in the sense that that's why they were keeping it a secret science because um, it you know it could be it could be disastrous. But you know there's other theories that the, uh, that uh, you know Falconelli was a, a nuclear physicist as well. You know. That, so, so there's a bunch of theories as to who he is. Um, so he might have actually fed into this kind of this nebulous network of people who were Falconelli essentially. So, um, but yeah, it's an interesting idea. But I, I, I tend to think it's it's based on you know kind of like a almost like a relative, you know, kind of Einstein's sort of ideas of like kind of you know sort of visualizing um, physics, but applying it to sort of proto chemistry. As we wind down our discussion here, there's one more thing I want to ask you before you talk about the book. Um, you're reading part of what is called the um, 
the uniform editions, the collected works of James Hillman, the, the copy called City and Soul, which is probably one of the more political pieces, uh, the political collections of essays, I would say, by Hillman, because what it involves is how do we bring about a restoration of the anima mundi or a world soul, or what some people call the reenchantment of the world. And, you know, given that here on Zero and Repeater, we talk about politics quite a bit. I was curious if there's any particular ideas that stand out to you in that book, or maybe you can just answer the question, like when it comes to insoling the world or reinsoling the world, what are some lessons from James Hillman that you really take to heart? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I like the idea that he kind of suggests that um, at the heart of the soul is Aphrodite, you know, that um, what really animates the soul is is beauty and love. Um, and um, he thinks that if we can engage or, or rather wake up and realize how much uh, we've been anesthetized to the soul and how much our surroundings anesthetize us. Um, so the word anesthetize obviously is the opposite of aesis, you know, the idea of aesthetics, you know. Um, and um, Hillman's very interested in the idea, the original idea of aesis, it was actually a, a thought of the heart rather than the brain. You know, and a breathing in of the world. I think I, he says "aesis" means like I breathe in. Um, and he he's saying that um, what would be politically it's kind of what you're saying. You were saying just a few minutes ago that what would be more politically, what would be politically, um, you know, inciting or, or revolutionary is is if we suddenly awoke to. Uh, the idea of where is the beauty in the world and and how how the world has lost beauty, so you know the, 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 and that we're anesthetized to it. So he 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 sees he sees revolution as always coming through kind of um, creative and colourful means and beauty and things like that. I mean, sometimes you know he he paints with a broad brush, but he you know he's saying like the, the, the Berlin Wall came down not because of politics but because of art. And, and and creativity and things like that um uh and actually i was in berlin last week and, and what was interesting i went to the stasi museum and uh the display outside about uh, it was all fanzines and and squat gigs and things like that you know so they, you know that that the, you know creativity is 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 essentially revolutionary but but hillman says you know it's 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 feeling, you know, the love, the, the essential, essential to it, and 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 actually overcoming the um, or, or realizing we've been anesthetized to it. And I, I, I just sort of need to look something up here, just because uh, uh, I, I made a note of it because it actually relates to a couple of things I was reading about. You know, I was kind of looking at Marx's idea of acid communism. And Marx had this idea of depressive hedonism, didn't he? Which is kind of similar to, uh, and, uh, and uh, I was reading some some guy's comment on Marx's depressive hedonism, and he was he was kind of saying he was calling it anaesthetic consumption or something like that. You know, so we consume in a in an anaesthetic way. You know, so sort of scrolling through social media is is an anaesthetic activity as opposed to an aesthetic activity. Uh, so my my take out at the moment from Hillman's um, City in the Soul is is you know based on you know visiting Berlin, Berlin last week and things like that and 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 and, and rereading this, this particular chapter is this idea that as you were saying that ties in with what Mark was thinking is that we need we need to it needs to come from a, a completely different point of view you know or different feeling or different engagement with the world which is essentially you know convivial and um, creative and colorful. Well, that's a phenomenal takeaway for me. I never thought about it in that that way. That, for example, the the technologies that we're utterly addicted to are anesthetizing, and what that means is it's robbing us of the potential to live a life where, through the lens of the aesthetic, and and to see the beauty in the world, and that is certainly at the heart of of Hillman's thought. 
Um, before we go, we definitely want to plug your book a little bit more, uh, The Astral Geographic, The Watkins Guide to the Occult. And what, besides alchemy, besides uh, geomancy, besides uh, psychogeography, what is it that that book is trying to do? It's almost like a magical itinerary or a travel log of sorts. What what kind of readers are going to lock into this book? Oh, really- yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, English Heritage was a kind of like a, a kind of very anarchic sort of psychogeographical sort of subversion of this this government quango called English Heritage. Whereas I think I'm playing a straight bat in 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 Astral Geographic. So I look at, but essentially the concept is to to tell the story of magic through geography. How can we? I mean, there's lots of ways of, of discussing the esoteric, different forms of esoteric practice, and, and, and but this is a particular way of telling that story through through location, through um, landscape, and things like that. So everything that is discussed has a, a, a cue and a narrative that's based on landscape. So even chapters like on tantra, I'm, I'm particularly looking at the carvings and things and, and, and how that's how that story is told or or um, gardens to tell the story of kind of sort of masonic thinking and things like that so that's that's one part of the book but the, the, the final part is a kind of uh, a application of uh, like a sort of mini grimoire that allows you to, to form sort of planetary magic but um and all these things that are really interest me about uh sort of uh, uh active imagination and things like that and then souling your world if not everybody else's world but in but it, my great interest is in creative occultism and in, in, in magic is a way of uh, of increasing your creativity and 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 um, working with creativity so I'm not really interested in materialistic gains other than the kind of what it does to my imagination um, and and that's the second part of the book but I apply like geographic principles for for engaging in in, in, in magical practice so it's got twofold really. Well, Andy, I was very pleased to have been introduced to you by uh, Tarek Goddard and to find a fellow Hillmanian on the other side of the pond. And I hope we can kind of continue this conversation over the weeks, months, and years in case anything Hillman-esque comes up that we need to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a real pleasure. And uh, um, yeah, as I said, it was really good to see um, um, you bringing that into Antiochus. It was, it was, I was, you know, I was what i wanted to see for a while really to be honest yeah yeah i know frederico do, does sort of does it to a certain degree but it's good that repeater uh, uh, exploring that area because it's very deep to my heart really to be honest yeah that's great and i i have federico tentatively scheduled for an interview sometime in the upcoming weeks and months so oh, that's great that, that's exciting well once again andy thank you everybody go out find the english heretic and find the astral geographic and we'll post links to that in the show notes and andy once again thank you oh thank you too great we appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.